2 часа 28 минут. Масса... Welcome to Space Vidcast 5.11 for Saturday, July 14th, 2012. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me is always the beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented Carrie Ann Higginbotham. Talented. <laughs> talented. She's very talented. Talented. We'll be your hosts as if that were ever different. Uh, so we've got, we've been gone for a couple of weeks, so we've got a ton of news. Let's get straight into it. First off, there was a launch of an Ariane 5. It brought uh, Echo Star, uh, what is it, 17? Oh, geez, I've forgotten. So. Echo Star something. Uh, Echo Star, Star 17, 17, which is a community, a Hue, that'd be Hue's communication satellite, and um, MSG3, which is a weather satellite. And since we're a space show, we figured we'd show you the launch. Okay. Seven, six, five, four. Trois, deux, unité, top, allumage moteur Vulcain. Allumage Vulcain. Top, allumage EAP, décollage. Top, c'est bon. Première manœuvre, orientation du lanceur. Les paramètres à bord sont normaux, la trajectoire est nominale. And there she goes, hauling herself against the gravity of the Earth. We've rotated to the east, we're heading out over the Atlantic. We're burning three engines, the Vulcan, which uh, we did light on the ground, but actually it's those two boosters which are doing all the work here. In fact, their job's really to get us away from the gravity of the Earth, isn't it? Yes, the boosters are providing 90% of the thrust right now, and each booster is burning two tonnes of propellant per second. To give you an idea, if you fill your car once a week, that's how much gas you'd use in a year. And we're just hearing it. We're 15 kilometers from the pad, Simon. We're just getting the sound of uh, the launcher as it flies over. In fact, we can uh, even feel the vibrations, can't we? It does oh. take a little while for the sound to get you, though, doesn't it? Well, like you say, 15 kilometers from a pad, but we do feel it. And of course, those in launch control, they too will certainly be feeling this. Uh, it's quite sensational. Well, then. <laughs> Interesting commentary. I've added at least some of that in. But yeah, Ariane 5, uh, which is the European Space Agency's uh, heavy lifter. Most called it their medium lifter, but that would be their Soyuz. Uh, so that, that happened um, uh, a couple weeks ago. So that happened. That was a thing. Uh, another thing that happened, uh, China landed. Uh, this is humorous because uh, because it was Chinese. I, I just find this funny. Like everyone's throwing their graphics on the screen, including us. So here you go. Graphic overlord, but overlord. Uh, but uh, China's Shenzhou 9, and I know I'm pronouncing it wrong, I'm sorry guys, uh, landed, and uh, here, here's some footage. Oh. 
But from another camera, we can see uh, the spacecraft is pretty close to the ground. It has landed, but, but it's turned it upside down. So it will be a little bumpy for the astronauts inside. Uh, they've been turned upside down. <laughs> but it has landed. Uh, Pretty awesome, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, China's manned space program. Uh, we have some comments from uh, the show from a couple weeks ago uh, that we're going to talk about at the end of the show uh, about how we were talking about um, how fast China's progressing. Um, it feels like they're moving really, really fast. You guys have a lot of opinions. You do, and they're all great. So yeah. we're going to bring those up. If you want to uh, talk more about China, we're going to do that at the ending of the show. Uh, so stick around for that. That's going to be in the third segment after the third break. Um, but it's... Um, um, it's just, it's really cool to see China, that was their manned docking mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Tiangong-1, mm -hmm. uh, which is their space station floating over Earth. And that was the landing, uh, undocking and landing uh, coverage of that. Uh, here's another interesting story. Uh, this is uh, uh, kind of the advancements of rockets, as it were. I'll let you take this particular one. Ooh. Bam! So, for those of you who don't recognize this, this obviously is Grasshopper. I should say, shouldn't say obviously, I suppose, because uh, it's kind of a dark picture, and it sort of just looks like a first stage, just kind of standing on top of some animal Platform. legs. Yeah. Uh, but that's kind of exactly what it is for the most part. Uh, the entire thing stands about 106 feet tall, and the idea is that we're going to start hopping. Huh? Ha, I see Hopping what they did there. Right see what they did there. Quite soon. The uh, the whole concept behind Grasshopper is that it's a reusable rocket booster. And so once the rocket goes up, this actually will come back down and land back on Earth as opposed to being discarded, uh, floating around in the water and and getting full of water and, and all of that other fun stuff and rust and goo and Lord only knows what. Uh, but so we're, they're going to start... Rust and goo. Right. You know, that's what happens when I can't think of what I wanted to say and <laughs> other words just start popping out of my mouth. Um, so the initial flights are going to be about 240 feet, about 45 seconds or so, uh, just to kind of hover, come back down, make sure that they can do it. And with it being only 106 feet tall, going up 240 feet is at least doubling the length of the entire vehicle anyhow. So it's not just coming off a couple feet and coming right back down. And then eventually they want to work up to a few thousand feet, I believe it is. And hopefully that's going to start testing later this year. Probably more likely next year. But that's going to start testing in Texas, uh, which is SpaceX's R&D, or not R&D, where they test engines. And it'll initially have... I learned this today. It will initially have, for its first hopping test, a Merlin 1D engine on it. Ooh. So there you go. That's all the things that fancy. I learned. Fancy. Fancy. So SpaceX making <laughs> rockets reusable, uh, which is an uh, interesting concept. Love to hear what you think about this project, the Grasshopper Project. Leave it in your comments uh, right here on SpaceVidCast.com, on YouTube, Facebook, whatever you may, uh, because this is something that uh, not a lot of companies have tried before. So, uh, uh, but there are, there have been companies trying this before. Actually, it was brought up, it brought up in the comments. It looks like a supersized Mastin rocket. It's known as vertical takeoff, yeah. vertical landing. So up, down, uh, and in, actually Mastin Space Systems won the Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander Challenge, which is now called something else. I don't know what, but at the time it was called the Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander Challenge uh, for doing, um, you know, taking off, uh, translating, land, you know, going over some but feet, that was, landing. as you said, a lunar lander design. Right. This is much bigger than that. Correct. And that's why they said it looks like a supersized mast in a rocket. Right. So, um, you know, not the first company to try to do it, but an interesting concept. Right. Uh, yeah. So. The nice thing is that if they can make every part of it reusable uh, like this, uh, it'll just, it'll slash costs by bunches. Bunches. Yep. I was going to say billions, and that's not the word I wanted. Well, let's let's continue slashing costs. Okay. Virgin Galactic, another new space company, has announced a new rocket launcher. This is really cool. Actually, this is really cool. There is a video that goes with this, so I'm just going to let uh, Richard Branson... I, I have actually not seen any other outlets roll this video, so I'm just going to roll the thing in its entirety because I think it's fascinating. So here you go. Richard, Richard Branson, Virgin Galactic's uh, new launching platform. Yeah. As I travel around the world, I see increasing and often tragic evidence of how the depletion of our world's natural resources is affecting so many people in our rapidly expanding global population. 
But this downward spiral does not have to be a one-way inevitability. At Virgin, we're determined to do things differently, to lead by example, and show that business can be an amazing force for positive change. Better access to space is not a silver bullet, but it is one vital component of a better future. Over the last few decades, advances in technology have revolutionized the way we live, work and play. And this also means that satellites can now be much smaller, much smarter and much more powerful. But one big obstacle remains. The old and inefficient method used to get satellites into orbit. But all that's about to change. Say hello to Launcher One, a revolutionary launch vehicle at a revolutionary price from Virgin Galactic. With a launch cost aimed to be the lowest in the market, Launcher One is an air-launched rocket from Virgin Galactic's uniquely efficient White Knight 2 carrier aircraft. Launcher One will build upon the design experience of the existing Spaceship Two manned space vehicle and leverage the unique manufacturing and flight testing facilities of Virgin Galactic's sister company, TSC. Steve, I've got uh, the brakes, you can pull the chocks. Well, the towers get two on holding short at 3-0, request to take off clearance. Runway 3-0, clear for takeoff. The pieces are all in place to transform the business of satellite launch. Four, three, two, one, release, release, release. Four. Paired with purpose-built small satellites, Launcher One will enable scientists to tackle global environmental challenges with unprecedented speed and precision. New space businesses will be able to get into operation quickly and cheaply. Nations, states, cities and even universities and schools will be able to launch dedicated satellites that will answer their diverse needs. Opening up space to everyone will allow us to see, experience and benefit from it in many different ways. At Virgin Galactic we have taken the initiative and we're making it happen. Because space is Virgin Territory. So, yeah, uh, you, I, they mentioned in the chat room dramatic music when mentioning blah, old blah, blah, blah. blah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's actually, uh, it was mentioned in the chat room, uh, 500 kilograms. It's actually 225 kilograms, uh, 500 pounds to low Earth orbit. Uh, interesting debate that happened in the chat room at the entire time going, what's really the market for this? Because it's estimated to be $10 million to launch, uh, 500 pounds to low Earth orbit. Um, and you look at other companies kind of in the same range mm -hmm. and you're not sure if there's a huge market for this particular uh, item. And it's also interesting, by yes. the way. Sorry, oh, go ahead. Say no, what no, no, go ahead. Uh, it's also interesting that um, they haven't even flown Spaceship 2 yet. Mm -hmm. And they're already looking at other markets. So I'm curious. It, it, it feels like a natural extension of White, White Knight 2. Yes. But at the same time... Why wouldn't you wait until Spaceship Two was flying and build upon the success of that? Is there something else going on? Right. Um, well, to a certain extent, yes. I, I think now, finally, uh, DJ Dr. P, William Pomerantz's uh, special projects uh, title is now defined. I think now we all sort of understand what's going on with that. Mm. Uh, and one of, I will say that not only does Virgin Galactic already have customers who are lining up out their door for this Launcher One, they are lining up out their door. I they mean, have we've got at least five confirmed customers. One of them, one of them, planetary resources. Planetary resources. Who obviously you're not going to be launching like tomorrow. But how many of them? I mean, planetary resources, cash positive, as I understand it, they've got some money. Mm -hmm. How many of the other 
uh, companies actually have real money. Yeah, but x -Corp doesn't have real money, do they? Maybe they do. Uh, this is a great debate. Uh, you know, of the customers they launched, um, how many of them are really going to be launching stuff at that price point? Um, you know, and, uh, uh, well, there's a, g a lot of really great debate in the chat room, so I, I guess we'll leave it at, leave your comments in the, ch in, in the chat uh, right. on YouTube, Facebook, so forth and so on. Um, but what do you think the market for this is? Do you think it's going to succeed? Uh, I'm not sure yet. I'm not saying it won't. I just, I find it interesting that we've got, um, a lot of companies targeting these smaller satellites because um, it's not just I launch lied, a one. not x -Corp. I'm so sorry. It's Sierra Nevada Space Systems. Okay. That they're going to be. Uh, Geo Optics, Spaceflight Inc., uh, Skybox Imaging, Planetary Resources, Sierra Nevada, and Survey Satellite. Actually, there's some money there. There's some money there. So yeah, uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, how well they do, how well they do, and if they really do change this. Another interesting comment that was brought up in the chat room is it's a, like a smaller version of Strato Launch. Mm -hmm. uh, for those who don't know, um, Bert Rutan, who kind of designed and, and built essentially uh, White White Knight One, Spaceship One, and then uh, subsequent White Knight Two and Spaceship Two, which is this kind of carrier aircraft and then um, uh, spaceship that goes underneath it also has helped form Strata Launch, which is basically a much, much larger version of Spaceship Two. Um, they're taking a 747, slicing it in half, and making a ginormous, gigantic thing uh, that'll launch a uh, rocket underneath it. So it's just like a miniature version of that. The question is, um, is it actually going to be worth it? Let's let's talk about that. Uh, I, I do want to get through the, at least one more story, and we'll, okay. we'll leave the one. Um, but we'll talk about it a little bit more in the... Um, uh, main topic of the show, uh, which wasn't supposed to be this, but I find it interesting. Um, but before we go to break, there was another interesting little thing, um, privatized space, kind of continuing that same trend. x -Corp, which we had just mentioned, mm -hmm. has announced a new R&D facility in Texas. There's a lot of stuff happening in Texas uh, right now. Here's a quick uh, soundbite for you, I think. I'm Andrew Nelson. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of x -Corp Aerospace. And this is a very exciting day for us at x -Corp. We also think it's a very exciting day for Texas and Midland. Um, we are going to be creating our research and development uh, flight test center here in Midland, Texas. Um, and we'll be building rocket engines as well as uh, reusable space planes to fly off the runway here and take off, fly up to the edge of space and come back. And we'll be taking uh, people, we'll be doing research, uh, we'll have uh, children's uh, experiments from schools, uh, scientists from all over the world, um, as well as we'll be developing our product development path from this vehicle to the next vehicle to a fully reusable vehicle, uh, as well as rocket engines for many people uh, around uh, the country and the world uh, tested right here. And it's a great day for us. I think it's a great uh, opportunity uh, to work with all the great research groups uh, in Texas um, and, to, and to build on the space legacy uh, that was created here 50 years ago. What's interesting is uh, all this kind of moving and shaking of new space companies. There seem to be um, three primary, three or four, I'm not sure, I'll count them out loud here, uh, but different areas of the country of the U.S. that are trying to attract these companies. Mm -hmm. One is the existing Space Coast, uh, Florida, uh, Space Coast, um, Florida, uh, Cape Canaveral area, because mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of people kind of um, slid out of the space shuttle program and they're trying to keep those people How employed. Weird. I know, right? Uh, the second area is, interestingly enough, Texas, mm -hmm. but when you think about it again, Space Shuttle Program, Houston, Texas, mm -hmm. right? That's where Mission Control was. But uh, Texas seems to be really trying to garner some attention. The third area is New Mexico mm -hmm. with Spare Spaceport America. Uh, and you know, that's actually where Virgin Galactic will be flying out of. That's their primary uh, spaceport is uh, Spaceport America. And the fourth area, so it was four, is uh, kind of the new Space Coast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Los Angeles area uh, in Mojave, uh, kind of, I'm going to clump all of that so together. Cal. So Southern California, I'm going to clump that all together. Uh, and it feels like a lot of these new space companies are already in Mojave. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you've got SpaceX in Hawthorne. Um, oh, in, Vandenberg. In, in, you've got Vandenberg kind of over here. As, well, not kind of over here. You have Vandenberg, which is uh, Air Force Base over here, here as well. So um, it, it's interesting to see these four areas kind of compete and try to grab these different companies. Uh, keep in mind, x -Corp will still be based, as I understand it, in in Mojave. In Mojave. Uh, they're just opening a new R&D facility in Texas. So awesome to them for you know, having enough uh, 
a capital and ability to kind of split operations into two. But I wonder what the advantage is splitting their operations into two is what the fi fiscal advantage is to have that brain trust kind of broken into two separate areas. Right. Not that you can't telecommute and stuff like that, but um, it's different. Right? I mean, right. When, when you're this close and you can kind of bounce ideas off each other, it's very different than being over the phone or even a telepresence. So uh, I'm wondering how that will work. Uh, and Vax Hedrum in the chat room says that uh, Midland, Texas in the middle of nowhere, so is Mojave. Mm -hmm. So that's not really any different. But that's what you want for rocket companies, especially R&D and testing, right? You want it nowhere near anyone. Right. So in, when things go wrong, when things don't go as, as planned, because they are experimental vehicles, which you can see the giant experimental on the side of the vehicles. Yeah. Um, when that happens, people don't get hurt. And this is the time that we want to test the vehicles, see what's wrong with them, blow them up, push them to their limits, push them beyond their limits, and see what we can do. And so that's why you want it in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Right. Uh, you don't want anyone near, nearby the vehicle. All right, let's take a quick break. And uh, when we come back, uh, the main topic for the show is going to be, we're going to continue talking a little bit about uh, Virgin Galactic, uh, but also, um, uh, you know, I've forgotten the main topic of the show. Can you help me out? Uh, yeah, it's uh, do we need big government? Oh yeah, do we need, oh hey, that ties in exactly, that's what it was, sorry. Uh, do we need big government? Um, anymore or can we kind of rely on new space for doing our space stuff so stay with us we'll be right back look into her face that turn our nation in her eyes she won't give up a quick or from a little fashion lines films on some expectation this girl's a fascination So before we went to the break, we talked about what our main topic is going to be, and that is um, kind of big government space, and do we really need that anymore? There are a lot of advocates for big gov government space, uh, you know, it's saying it just doesn't make financial sense for private companies to go out there and push the boundaries of space. Um, but in today's day and age, where you can test and prototype so quickly, easily, and cheaply, is that still the case? Is that still truly... Um, how things work. And, and going back a little bit earlier, we were talking about Virgin Galactic and they've got Launcher 1 now. Um, these are kind of innovative new models. Um, NASA looked at doing this, uh, the original, very, very first space shuttle, something similar to what uh, Spaceship 1, Spaceship 2, White Knight 1, White Knight 2 uh, is like, where it was a carrier aircraft and then you, you kind of launch the, uh, the shuttle off the carrier aircraft. But they never built that. Um, they built instead the space shuttle, which was at best a refurbishable vehicle, not a reusable vehicle, right. um, and at worst, um, barely usable vehicle. <laughs> I mean, you, you re basically rebuilt the engines from, I don't want to say from scratch, but you completely rebuilt the engines after every single flight. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a billion dollars to launch every single space shuttle. It did not drop the cost of space access. But you look at Virgin Galactic, you, you know, we're talking about that $10 million to space for only 500 pounds. Maybe that is good enough you know, as a starting point. Keep in mind, this is a starting point. Right. This, this, is where they're be this is where they're beginning. This isn't where they're ending. I think Neeling brought that up um, er earlier as well, is, is this is version one. What happens in version two? It gets bigger and better. Version three gets bigger and better. The difference being the timelines are not what we're used to. You get an iPhone every year. You're right. not getting right. a new spaceship every year. Or are you? Well, yeah. <laughs> with yeah. with advanced prototyping, maybe we could. Right. Uh, you know, maybe not, not at first, right? I think it's a little bit real unrealistic right now. But um, you know, as these manufacturing well, techniques you know, exactly, you may not be getting a new spaceship uh, from the exact same company every single year. But you're right, right? Like uh, between X Core and I can't think anymore. I'm so sorry. Armadillo, Mastin. Yes. All yep. of those people and SpaceX and, you know, the list goes on and on and on. You know, yeah, maybe because Virgin's going this way and SpaceX is going that way and Masson's going this way and x is going that way that um, you could have potentially something new and different every year. Now, the USKO brings up an interesting point, which is if you want to continuously go further, then yes, no f sufficient business case to push the frontier. But 
SpaceX wants to go to Mars. Right. NASA has not, I'm sorry, let me reword that. SpaceX has stated they want to put humans on Mars. Right. NASA um, has not put humans on Mars. Right. ESA has not put humans on Mars. Right. No one has put, humans have never stepped foot on Mars. Right. So that's pushing the frontier, but they're still trying to do it anyhow. And they seem to be doing pretty good from a business standpoint. They. SpaceX. Thank you. SpaceX seems to be doing pretty well from a business standpoint and building, you know, building up technologies to make it to Mars. Mm -hmm. um, there are others who have said, I want to go to Mars as well. Mast in space systems, sitting r like right there, right over there, uh, showing us plans on his, his vehicles that will get humans to the moon, right. to Mars, wherever you want to go. Uh, well, not quite well, yeah, you know, inside of our star system. So, so held ask saying SpaceX, SpaceX is special. What about mass in space systems? I mean, what is is mast in special too? What about Virgin? I mean, Virgin doesn't talk a lot about it a whole lot, but what if they do start building bigger and better vehicles? The vehicles they have now. Okay. Obviously, they have special projects going. Mm -hmm. uh, the 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 news of uh, Launcher One really isn't all that new, other than they're so much further in the process. Uh, they had talked about Launcher One like four years ago. Hmm. And we all kind of went, all right, cool, that, that'll be neat when that comes around. Right. But nothing really came of it. It was like, hey, we want to sort of do this. And everyone went, great, when you have something, let us know. <laughs> and now they're so much closer to actually having something. Well, now they have animations. It, well, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I, I, I think, uh, yeah, paper rockets, I, somebody in the chat room had mentioned. Yeah, yeah, we can have paper rockets every single year, but who really cares until you actually have something going on? Um, you know, then that, that's a bigger deal than at that point, when you can physically say, look, here's this cool thing that we made. Sure. Or, you know. So then what's the business case? So um, I think you, UK, USKO brought up a um, very valid point, which is what if you're a company, you need to make profit. You, mm -hmm. you, you die if you don't, right? right, you, right, you, right. you just go out of business. Um, the government doesn't have that same problem. Um, you, if NASA loses money, then they'll just, you know, more tax dollars next year, off you go. And that, assuming that they get those tax dollars. Assuming tax, they, absolutely. Right? Assuming they get the tax dollars. Assuming that the money doesn't change with the political wins. But, right. let's, but that's a different problem. They're not required to turn a profit. In fact, they, they won't turn a profit. Right. So, um, is it really better suited for governments in that regard to try to push the frontier forward as opposed to private space who must make a profit doing this right. uh, or they just they, they can't pay their employees? Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. the question. Yeah. And this is where we'd love your, your opinions and your comments. What is the future of space? Because we're seeing really amazing things happen in new space. Virgin Galactic, you heard all the things. We, we keep chanting them over and over. You've seen them in the show over and over and over again. And then you look at what NASA's doing with this uh, space launch system, and you just kind of go, that's not going to get built. If I may really quickly, somebody was asking if Branson is pitching Launcher One now uh, to get some sort of support. Actually, he has a lot of support. There's a, a, a Saudi Saudi Arabia company, I believe it is, that owns like a third of Virgin. They're like the main mm. money providers for Virgin. So I don't think Branson's like, hey guys, and we can do this too, and trying to build support. He's got the support that he needs, is my understanding. I mean. Not like forever, obviously, right? He only has the 529, I think it is, people who are signed up to to fly with them when they're actually flying humans. And obviously, you know, there's all these other people who are interested in Launcher One, but kind of like you said, how many of them really have money quite yet to do such a thing? I'm interested in Launcher One. I can't afford it, but I'm interested uh, in it. Right, <laughs> I'll right. I'll sign my name on she Space Vidcast once I put a payload into orbit. <laughs> Yay. Me. <laughs> <laughs> I owe you. I want to go to orbit. <laughs> so, yeah, so there's, there's stuff like that, but um, just for day-to-day -day stuff right at the moment, he's got the money to do that part of it, at mm. least. So I, I don't think that's what he's trying to do at the moment. Um, but uh, looking, again, pushing the frontier, right? right? That's what we're talking about. And the business case for pushing the frontier. Planetary resources, mm -hmm. asteroid mining. Mm -hmm. You know what NASA's not doing? You know what ESA's not doing? You know what JAXA's not doing? Right. Asteroid mining. Right. Here's planetary resources, a bunch of private guys going, we're going to do asteroid mining. The chat room says, well, they're the exception. How many How many exceptions does it take well, to make and, it the norm? And why, why are they the exception? Like Because one of them or a few of them dared to take on the philosophy of, you know, no one said that we can't do this, so we're just going to. 
mm. right? Because yes, now they are starting to not necessarily run into roadblocks per se, but they are running into a few people saying, "You can't just, you can't just do that." Like, what happens when you bring stuff home? Now, what are you going to do with that? You can't just sell that, which was something I'm sure they anticipated running into. And yet at the same time, if you don't push up against those those laws, those rules, those boundaries, you're never going to know what you can or can't do, what you can or can't accomplish. Just because nobody else has tried to go out and do that because they said, oh, well, what happens when we bring home palladium? And then, then now what? Everyone's going to freak out about stuff like that. No, just go and do it. I don't know. Sorry. Uh, you know, Meline says they're actually not the exception. They're talking about planetary resources. There's another organization doing asteroid identification and threat mitigation. Uh, and I did that really fast. Yeah, you did. Uh, wow. Job. Bam. You uh, and uh, that's kind of my point, right? It, how, how many of these exceptions does it take to make it the norm? Right. And, and I feel like we don't even know all of the exceptions yet. We, we just know the big players that have kind of made it public. I'm sure there are a lot of scary, crazy geniuses thinking about this stuff doing it kind of on their own, on their own dime. And this goes back to uh, other comments I've made about the maker community saying, eh, I don't think they can make it. And I, frankly, I flip back and forth on this particular, well, I do. It does, it's kind of I do, normal. and you know, I try to poke at you guys to get you to comment a little bit. But realistically, um, you know, they're, I don't want to say the word realistically. What if, right? What if a guy in his basement really, truly does make a suborbital vehicle that can get you to space for like $500,000? Awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, we talk about reducing the cost of space transport. Um, I just want a jetpack. If y'all could just work on that, <laughs> so that'd be great. There's actually, there's a, there's a, there's a video on that. Yeah, I know. Oh, all right. That's, Is that's that where that comes from? It, yeah. All right. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I, I guess that's kind of the, the fundamental point. And, and like I said, we, we'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, what is the future here? Is it going to be government space? Uh, it, the easy answer is it's going to be a combination of both. And today it is, right? You, we've got uh, money from government funneling into some of these private space companies. Great. But let's go forward 10 years. What happens as the polit political winds shift? Mm -hmm. What happens after spa uh, uh, the space launch system? I have to think about it every time. Keep trying to call it the Senate launch system. What happens after the space launch system is canceled? I, I think there's a very high probability of that. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. And, and it does seem like a really cool rocket uh, with a lot of payload to low Earth orbit and kind of you know, room to grow. But it's so far out there. It's so far out there that it's really hard to be inspired by it. And it's very easy for political winds to go, well, that was an Obama rocket, so let's cancel it. You know, not the Republicans right. or whatever. And then, you know, the Republicans take over. They're like, we're going to make Space Launch System 2.0, and it's going to be more awesome. And, and then, you know, they're, they're 30 years out, and then the Democrats come back in and go, well, that was a Republican rocket, so we're going to cancel it. And you just get this never-ending cycle of canceled rockets. Yeah. Um, it feels like that's what may happen. Um, okay. Right? So then what? So then what? So who do, we, who do we rely on? What happens then? Or is the U.S. just not going to lead this market anymore? Maybe it is government, but it's not U.S. government. Right. Uh, right, so that that yeah. could be it. Eh? Yeah. See what it did there. That that leads us into our next segment. I think pretty nicely, right there. Uh, what what's our next segment? We have Q and A. Oh, we do have Q and A. Uh, why don't we do this? Let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about stuff that we talked about before that you guys commented on. That's a t it's Q and A. Mm -hmm, Q and A. In these experiments, you can see the disorientation resulting when an animal is suddenly placed in a weightless state. Cats, when dropped under normal conditions, will invariably rotate their bodies longitudinally in midair and land on their feet. This automatic reflex action is almost completely lost under weightlessness. Those poor, poor kittens. What <laughs> 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 hit the ceiling? I know. Oh, it's like, what is it. going on? <laughs> Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> I don't understand. It's kind of terrible. I'm sorry. Let's take a peek at some of the comments <laughs> from our last show, Space Fidcast 5.10. Um, this was in regards to. Um, uh, doubling NASA's budget, approximately doubling NASA's budget, from uh, uh, half a cent on the dollar on the dollar to one penny. <laughs> we were dollar. having this conversation earlier, and you were like, "What happens when NASA's budget is one penny?" And I was like, "One penny on the dollar." Yeah, <laughs> well, you knew what I meant. 
So, all right, here, uh, this is from uh, Baby Kicks 03. Hey, how's it going, Space Vidcast? I'm Bart Bork. I'd like to make a commentary on the Penny for NASA uh, video that you showed, uh, the push by Neil deGrasse Tyson. And uh, uh, it's a comment about, you know, how you were saying that uh, NASA has a lot more rules on it now and that even with the extra money, they wouldn't be able to accomplish a whole lot more. And I think that where you and uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson differ is that I'm... And I could be wrong, but Neil deGrasse Tyson seems to more be interested in, in his speeches and such on the science missions, uh, not the manned missions. And while the manned missions are very expensive, and even doubling NASA's budget, you still wouldn't be able to get to Mars uh, with, with the manned side of NASA. There's a lot of, there was recent cuts in NASA's budget, and there's a lot of missions that could go on. If you double NASA's budget, especially in... The science side of NASA is a small portion of the budget, and it does, to me, the most amazing work. Not that manned missions aren't important, but, we're, I mean, if you look at the Cassini mission, if you look at the Mars rover missions, these missions were a fraction of what it cost to even bring people to the International Space Station. And they've excited millions of people, and we've learned a lot from them. And there's missions out there, like a mission to Europa. A mission, a, a mission similar to Cassini to Jupiter, uh, the uh, exoplanet finder mission that would actually image exoplanets. Could you imagine if we find an Earth-like planet and we could actually take an image? Now you wouldn't be able to see it like Earth, but you'd be able to take the spectra of it and see that it has oxygen and water in its atmosphere. And how much would that push people to want it? Like, man, there's a planet up there that could have life, could be like Earth. I think that would actually drive people to want to support NASA more than, oh look, people are back on the moon. So while I do agree that Congress is way too much into NASA, I think if you could increase NASA's budget, on the pl on, at least on the science side, there's amazing things that could be done. And that's all I got. Thank you. So one thing that kind of struck me when I was watching this video uh, was that uh, obviously, he's a big supporter of the planetary sciences sure, and, yeah. and, and that kind of thing. And we have a, a, a particular bend on human spaceflight in mm -hmm. general, uh, but that's just that's because of, that's what our per personal interest is. And I love that he made the comment about how the uh, robotic missions are so much cheaper than the human spaceflight missions. And someone in the chat room said, "Well, yeah, but they haven't done a whole lot." And when the when the comment was made in the chat room, I was like, "That's exactly what I was thinking." I was like, "Well, yeah, but planetary sciences. I mean, they've done they've done a lot of stuff, but at the same time, you know, if we could have put a human on Mars, we could have learned all of those things so much faster, so much quicker, all of that other stuff. They haven't really done a whole lot." And then the person in the chat room sort of revamped their statement, and they said, "Well, I mean, the human spaceflight." Those missions haven't done a whole lot. And I thought, how funny that somebody on the human spaceflight pro side was like, man, those stupid robotic missions, they haven't done a whole lot. And yet the person in the chat room was actually talking about how the human spaceflight missions haven't done a whole lot in comparison to the robotic missions. Interesting point. And, and I, I think that's why we need both. Um, <laughs> and, and you can't starve the planetary resources stuff. No. I think the robotic missions are just as important as the human missions. And we try to put these emphasis on one or the other, the thing is you need them both. Yeah, you, uh, yeah. For example, uh, it is far easier to send a robot to a, an alien world and if something goes wrong, I don't want to say that's okay, but no life, no life was lost, right? right? Um, it's just, it is easier. Uh, you don't have to have the environmental systems. It's still very difficult, but it's easier than sending a human. However, if you can send a human, the amount of science that that human can do on the red planet, for example, on Mars, is vastly greater right. than any robot we've designed today. So, y yeah, Curiosity is going to be epic. I mean, this is going to be a scary advanced machine. We're big fans of Cassini. We're big fans of Juno, the one that's going to Jupiter. We're huge. We got super excited about that. It was really, really awesome. And you can't really send humans to Jupiter, at least not yet. Uh, so can't really so land on Jupiter. Right. So, there, <laughs> so there's that. Uh, they each have their own merits and their own way for their... It's sort of like they're just two distinctly different things. 
for the same purpose. But imagine the amount of science we could do if we did have a human right. on Mars, right? Uh, I, I forgot, I don't even know if this is a real stat, but I'm going to pretend like it is. Okay. Uh, I heard something along the lines of all the science we've done on Mars could have been accomplished by one human in about two weeks. Like, of all time. I heard a if, month, but still. Sure. Even let's if say, you say a month. One year. Let's just say, yeah, six months to a year. <laughs> uh, you know, that's since all, that's all of it, right? That's crazy. I mean, the. You really, if you want to do, if we're looking for fossils, we're looking for life, a human's going to be able to be just way better at that than a robot is. But you still need to send those robots. you, you got to figure some of this stuff out. Yeah. So they're equally important. So, um, uh, I do think it's a valid point. Right now, we don't have humans doing a whole lot in, a whole lot inspirational in space. We're certainly learning stuff right. that we already learned in the 70s. So we're relearning some stuff, but um, nothing... I mean, where are, the, where are the centrifuges, right? right? Where's the really cool stuff from the ISS that we were supposed to have that got cut? Right. Um, I just, I don't see it. So, um, all right, so um, this is epic future space on um, uh, China and their advancements and the, and the rate that they were going at when we were talking about um, uh, the Chinese space program. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Mike from Epic Future Space, and I just wanted to real quickly respond to Space Vidcast's most recent episode. First of all, Ben, you're crazy. <laughs> no, for real, though. Uh, the question you guys had was, can China make it to the moon? And I really think that they can. When you look at their program, for a long time, people didn't take them seriously because they considered them pre-Mercury program, just like you guys said. With them having the Shenzhou spacecraft and Shenzhou 5 got them to the Mercury program status, with it being comparable to the Soyuz capsule, which is a three-person capsule comparable to the Apollo capsule, also three person and with China starting off with that sort of level of capsule I think that right now they have successfully completed their Gemini program they've already done a spacewalk they've already done unmanned and now man docking what they're doing and how they've done things has been so efficient I mean the amount of money they have spent over this entire 13 year period of them actually doing the Shenzhou program doesn't even compare to what we spend on NASA in one year and that's what they've spent over 13 years. So I definitely think with their level of efficiency and the way that they're doing things, they definitely could make it to the moon in, you know, 10 years, maybe even less. So I guess the question that we all need to ask ourselves is, does China even want to go to the moon? I mean, they have all this stuff planned for Tiangong, and they're going to build a much larger version that's a little bit more like the Muir space station. So, yeah, they've talked about going to the moon, but have we actually seen them, you know, at least drawing up hardware or even building anything? What do they want to do? And what sort of steps are they going to be taking to, to do that? Thanks for listening. So that brings up a very valid point, um, which isn't that um, they can't do it because we haven't seen it. It's just that China's very secretive. So they could be working on it right now. We have no idea. Yeah, that was adorable. Mike's like, well, I mean, have we seen anything? Like, yeah. We don't see anything until they've accomplished it, really. Kind of, right? Like, China's right like, hey, just to let you know, we landed like last week and we had 12 people. It was awesome. I mean, it's like you don't know anything until it's already done. It was brought up in the chat room, well, they need a much bigger <laughs> rocket. Uh, there are more ways to go to the moon than just by getting a bigger rocket. You don't have to Von Braun it, right? I mean, um, Von Braun it, sorry. Uh, so uh, taking a rocket and just going, boom, straight to the moon. You can stage it. You can do it in smaller increments. For example, you could, I don't know, build your own space station and use that as a launching post to go to the moon. Mm -hmm. Interesting concept. If only they had a... Sp Oh, oh wait, wait, they, they do. do. So they have different options. Now, I actually, I haven't looked to see what uh, inclination it's at and if they actually could use it as a, uh, a, a way to get to the moon. For example, the International Space Station is at the wrong inclination. Uh, we, we would be a very bad place to try to launch from, right. launch from to get to the moon. Uh, and I, I never bothered until this moment in time thinking about, could you use Tiangong-1, uh, I pronounced that wrong, I know, uh, to, to use as a, a launching station. Um, right. Maybe, or maybe that's just kind of their test bed to test their docking, you know, kind of do a, a Gemini style, you know, can we do all of this stuff and then put, put up uh, Tiangong 2 in the proper location and, uh, you know, use that as a launch bed to get to the moon. So you don't have to have a Saturn V class vehicle to get to the moon. You do if you want to do it in one jump, but you don't have to do it in one jump. And there are benefits to both processes, right? So if you do it with the space station, you've got a little bit more uh, ability to do more than just flags and footprints, right. but you have to build a lot more infrastructure. It is interesting, though, uh, to, to say that, yeah, China has said that they want to go to the moon, and from all outside perspectives, which is really all we have, uh, it doesn't look like they necessarily, that that's what they're shooting for per se. It, it sort of looks like, uh, you know, maybe kind of, sort of, like, we can kind of piece together some information. It's, it's like a, 
It's like a build your own mystery. Uh, but we don't know exactly for sure. So or interesting. Or maybe they're moving a lot slower. Um, we've always referenced them against the US space program. Um, here's a comment from USKO, which I think brings up a lot of very valid points. So in the last episode of Space Vidcast, it was mentioned that the Chinese space program was progressing really fast because they seemed to go directly from the Gemini stage straight to Skylab in only a few years. Thing is, that's just not true. The problem some people seem to have is that they think of the Chinese space program as if it were a knockoff of the American space program, but it isn't. It's a knockoff of the Soviet space program. So what happens when you look at Chinese space efforts in these terms? The first Chinese satellite, Dongfang Hong-1, was launched in 1970, whereas Sputnik 1 was launched in 1957. It took the Soviets four years to launch their first human into orbit. That happened in 1961 with Yuri Gagarin. It took the Chinese 33 years to do the same. They launched Shenzhou 5 in 2003. The first Soviet spacewalk came less than four years after their first manned flight, in 1965. The Chinese program moved at a similar pace, delivering the first EVA in just under five years. Shenzhou 7 was launched in 2008. The first Soviet space station, Salyut 1, was launched in 1971, ten years and one week after their first manned flight. Its first crew launched three days later on Soyuz 10. The first Chinese space station, Tiangong-1, was launched in 2011, eight years after their first manned flight. Its first crew was launched in 2012 on Shenzhou-9. It's somewhat important to understand that the Soviet Union had conducted a total of 18 manned flights by this stage in their program, launching 29 people into orbit, whereas China has so far launched four manned missions with a total of nine people having flown. This is why I don't think it's unreasonable for me to request that the people in the comments section please tone down their China worship. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, valid points all. Yes. But one interesting Quite. stat that he, he kind of was brought up but not really mentioned is the timelines are begin beginning to compress right. more, right? So everything's happening faster and faster and faster. So the you know the first the first big milestones like 30 years apart, but now they're starting to do things faster than Russia did. Mm -hmm. So certainly, if you were to compare the programs one to one, you're right. However, they're not the same programs, uh, and they are different programs, and they're doing things in kind of a different way. And so it's possible that because of the way they've done things, they could actually start to really rapidly excel. Uh, accelerate, excuse me, what they're doing in space. Well, or they could slow down. I, so I, you're suggesting that China will uh, get to a pace in which they will surpass any other space program? They could. I'm saying that is possible. Uh, I'm I not saying that's what will happen. Right. Uh, you know, China is very secretive, so really don't know. I mean, I, I have no clue. But um, when you look at what they're doing, it is impressive. And whether you compare it to the U.S. or the Russian uh, space program, um, they are starting to make strides in kind of those same areas. And, you know, maybe it's not moving as fast as we all kind of make them out to be, mm -hmm. but they are still moving forward. And um, the, what's yet to be seen is, are they just going to simply copy what the U.S. did in the Apollo era? Mm. Or, you know, what we've kind of done and said, look, we're going to build our own space station and fly around the Earth for 30 years. Maybe we'll do flag and footprints on the moon. Or are they going to push everyone forward and say, we're actually building a colony on the moon and we're going to Mars and we're going to an asteroid and really doing things that no one else has done before? Because frankly, to date, they haven't done anything that anyone else hasn't done before. So it should be boring. It's still exciting because it's humans in space. But, you know, right. the, the reason it's exciting is because you can kind of use your imagination and go, I see where they could go with this. The question is, will they go there? Hmm. So, pose that to you and, the, uh, you know, answer that. What do you think? Will they go there? Will they actually do that? Uh, this was brought up earlier today on Twitter. Um, love your show and I have a question. When do you think the next heavy lift rocket will launch and what will it be? Um, so, uh, eh. Uh, who, who's de the definition of heavy lift rocket seems to have shifted a little bit. For example, right. um, is this a heavy lift rocket capable of bringing us to the moon like a, a Saturn V class rocket? Mm -hmm. um, a rocket of that caliber, um, 
I just don't see in the immediate timetable, uh, frankly. From anyone? From anyone. Uh, there is including this... Including Russia, including ESA, including ISRO, including yeah. JAXA. Correct. I just don't see it on any immediate timetable, uh, including the U.S. And th that's when the, the geeks in the chat room go, space launch system! And I will refer back to earlier, I... As, as cool as it seems like it will be, I just do not believe it will get built. And um, it's just, it's not because NASA's bad or anyone's wrong, it's just the political winds will shift and the funding for it will get killed and it will be completely outside of the control of NASA to build that rocket. So um, someone, I don't believe SLS will ever fly. Someone in the chat room brought up uh, Falcon Heavy. Uh, so this is where we get into the question of what are you defining as a heavy rocket? Is right. the Delta IV Heavy actually a heavy rocket? Um, so in those class, in, in that kind of class, uh, there's the Falcon Heavy. Um, um, is this like the WWE where we had used to have like a heavyweight champion and then we had like a world champion because you can't have two heavyweight champions, <laughs> Kinda, yeah. like, but they are essentially the same level of belt? Like, is that what we're yeah, starting to yeah, get into? Like, yeah, right. Ultra because, super de duper heavy? Yeah, I mean, how do you classify a Saturn V, Saturn V class, I guess? So, um, we... Uh, we've got these uh, Falcon Heavy, which I believe SpaceX has announced testing begins um, this year or uh, early next year. Yeah, it's 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 like within the next twelve months from now, essentially. So I, I don't I don't know when that will actually fly. Actually, I, I really won't comment on that. Um, if you don't know, I do work at SpaceX, and as such, I try not to comment on any SpaceX related material, uh, mostly because. Um, this show is separate from SpaceX, so the views and comments on this show have nothing to do with SpaceX and vice versa, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, uh, but SpaceX has publicly announced they are building Falcon Heavy, mm -hmm. which is essentially a Falcon 9 core with two more Falcon 9 cores on either side for a total of 27 Merlin engines. It will be awesome. Remember uh, when the, we showed the Ariane 5 and they said that they could feel it and it was really cool? This will be like that. Yeah, so it will it will be uh, pretty big, and uh, they have announced plans to try to start test launching it soon. Well, when it will actually go, um, I'm, I'm not actually uh, not actually sure. Um, as Black Project said, it will be loud, and I am super excited for that. Uh, so yeah, that uh, soon. If, if you're looking at that classification of rocket, I think a lot sooner than later. Um, and there is a uh, where there was a recent talk by Dr. Uh, Bob Zubrin. And uh, he talked about, he, he's a huge advocate for Mars Direct, which is where you do the Von Braunian style, don't build a space station, don't do anything else, go from the planet to the other planet and you're done. One vehicle, boom, actually his is two, right? Um, right. And um, he has something called Mars Semi-Direct, which can use the Falcon um, 9, or Falcon Heavy, I'm sorry, it uses Falcon Heavy rockets um, to kind of do it in more launches. Mm -hmm. So it takes, you can't do it in two launches, it takes, I forgot, like four or six. It's annoying, yeah. Um, yeah, and so we're actually editing that up right now, and um, uh, those slides, we have to basically rebuild the slides from scratch, so it's taking a little bit longer than we want, um, but Epic subscribers will have full access to the entire session, uh, including the Q&A. Uh, the uh, non-Epic subscribers will only have the, the base uh, material, but yeah, that was at the last AIAA meeting in Los Angeles, um, and you know that's some of the cool stuff that a Falcon Heavy like rocket can unlock. Um, but I believe a Delta IV rocket, Delta IV Heavy, mm -hmm. um, which is you know an existing heavy rocket, massed in space systems can launch to Mars on top of that, mm. right? Yeah, I believe. I believe he said yes. Yeah. So um, you know it's. Uh, yeah, it's coming soon. I, I think there's a lot more so, rocket design. Well, all right, so n not to nail you down, but uh, in the next two years? Yeah, in the next two years. Next two, between two and five years? Between two and five years. Okay. Yeah, next yeah. Two, in the next two, two years. I think within the next two years, we're going to start to see some, some stuff kind of get generated. Um, and maybe we'll actually see SLS start to get built. Uh, mm. All right. Let's just do a couple more, just really okay. quick. Um, uh, this is just a quick question as to uh, why does Space Vidcast, uh, why not start a Space Vidcast forum for everyone to openly discuss topics? We've actually talked about this a little bit before in our After Dark shows, uh, but the reason we don't do it is because forums are a fantastic amount of work to actually get working correctly, keeping the spammers out, keeping the topics fresh, and not just having it be a dead space with like one or two people participating. Mm -hmm. uh, when we hit a critical mass and a forum is really an area we need to go into, uh, we'll look at it at that point, so we're not saying no to forums, we're just saying that for, right now the timing is not right for a forum. However, that's not to say 
say that you have no place where you can discuss this stuff. We do have a wiki at wiki.spacefeedcast.com, and there is a talk page on wiki, so you can actually go, and every episode, especially the, the like this one, all the season four, season five stuff, um, they're all actually pre-laid out in the wiki. So if you ever want to know what next week's episode is going to be about, just go to the wiki. It will tell you the stories. We're going to be, you know, like the suggested stories for next week, and you can add your own stories into the wiki article, and you can start conversations in the talk page. So certainly check out Space Vidcast's wiki page, um, help, you know, add stories to it, talk to us about things that you're interested in. Um, the NASA, uh, no, YouTuber78 uh, is doing a fantastic job on, on our wiki page right now, kind of organizing it and making it go. But yeah, there's a lot of great information in there about every single show. And here's the really interesting thing, stuff we don't get to mm -hmm. stays in the wiki. Right. So there was a, there was a Liberty a story that is in my timeline yeah, that we, we just didn't have time, time for. Um, that whole thing, including the video for that, is in the wiki. So check out wiki.spacevidcast.com. And kind of, I, once we see a really great um, interaction on the wiki, that will tell me that it's, it's time for uh, uh, a forum. For a, a real forum, forum. At that point, yeah, exactly. And uh, finally, uh, yay, the intro is back. <laughs> so I like that. I know. Really? I, I had to throw that one in there. Really? Uh, so the, the misspellings and all. Misspellings and all. Yeah, and it needs to be updated, which is one of the reasons why we haven't uh, run it. There are actually are there's an inaccuracy in the intro, and there's mm -hmm. some misspellings in the intro, and it drives me bonkers. And uh, the intro needs to have more video in it, and we just haven't had a chance to really flush it out quite yet. So I try not to air it unless I have to. It's like the bottom of the to-do list. It sort is. Sort of like with the AIAA talks, the LA Space Salon talks, like trying to get all of that stuff out, uh, which obviously is taking us long enough anyhow. Uh, and then it's sort of like, oh, right, and then are open. Yep. So, all right, on that note, uh, that's our show. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for watching live. Remember, we'll do these approximately once every week. We try to do them every Saturday at that 2200 Coordinated Universal Time. Uh, you can do that time zone conversion yourself. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling evil today. Ben's voice is like <laughs> angels singing directly into your ears. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, you know what? I will. Um, I am going to read... For those of you who subscribe to Space Feedcast Epic or are watching live, um, we sent a faux description of what Space Feedcast is to New Space for their website, and we had a ton of fun. This will never make it on anything public, I hope. Someone made the wildly inappropriate. Of asking us if, you know, I know you changed your logo, so I'm wondering if your show description changed. Huh. And my immediate reaction was like, no. Actually, it's and then Ben's reaction was like, maybe it has. Uh, actually, we should really, really do something with this. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, and actually, I think I think Heldesk is right. I actually think the show is actually 2100 UTC, not 2200. I misspoke. <laughs> Oops. All right, on that note, uh, thank you so much for joining us. If you like to hear what that description is, make sure you sign up to Space Vidcast Epic. Epic is what helps us produce the show and get hopefully better cameras in the future and uh, do live events like New Space 2012, which we're going to hopefully be covering. Um, and then we'd love to start bringing the AIAA meetings and LA Space Salon meetings to you live as opposed to just on demand. Um, Which so, is really difficult because they're always in places with no broadband whatsoever. We right? can't even tweet from there. But it's with awesome. your Epic subscription, that helps us to purchase things like uh, 4G access cards mm -hmm. and cameras and you know the equipment necessary to make it go live. And uh, so we very much so appreciate your Epic subscription. As a thank you for Epic subscriptions, uh, we give you access to an ad-free show, like no Google pre-rolls, no Google. Uh, mid rolls, no pop up ads. But those space cats, you're still going to see. You still that. get the space cats because those are awesome. Uh, and we also give you access to extra content. For example, the QA session from the Zubrin talk when we mm -hmm. post that, from other speeches from LA Space Salon. Uh, normally, the public version of these videos are about 20 minutes. The version you get is like an hour, hour and a half long. Uh, great QA stuff. And that's uh, available at spacefigcast.com slash epic. Subscriptions start at just under $10 per month, uh, depending upon whether you go monthly or yearly. And that's what helps us make the show go. So if you if you like the show, please uh, sign up there. On that note, I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. Space Vcast After Dark is up next. We'll see you next week.